Yeah, it's a fascinating thing. If I'm curious, I'm going to be moving forward. Oh, what's that? And it's not like stressful focus where you close your mind in around the danger, the threat. Curious attention actually has a broad, oh, that's really good. Oh, and there, there, and that one scans because one feels safe. Okay, Richard, welcome to the show. In another conversation, I heard you say that wonder was your favorite word. Can you tell me why why this is your favorite word? Oh, well, look, I'll say hello first, Niall. And, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's uh, wonderful to, to see you. I, I, I always uh, actually on uh, birthday greetings and things, I put wonder hyphen full. May you have a wonderful day. But um, yeah, wonder has uh, uh, certainly been a part of my life. And then, you know, when I, I teamed up with Ernest Rossi um, of, uh, of, of many, many fames, uh, he was also in right into that, that, that framework. And so it's really curiosity. And I've taken this a long way since then. And really looking at curiosity as being one of the central, um, the central most beneficial quality or state of, of mind that you can be in. And I've done quite a bit of looking further into um, proposing a whole neuroscience of it and getting a bit deeper than just sort of what I f- what felt good, but it certainly feels good. And because uh, I came uh, initially into the into the world of psychotherapy through the through the world of acting. I was a, an actor for 25 years. And if you're not curious in acting, and if you're not responsive and engaged and have great rapport and uh, look for what the other person is giving you in acting, then, well, you're, you're, you're a terrible soap opera actor. But, uh, yeah, so wonder is the, is the key, the, 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 how it affects the nature of the way, the orientation of our mind, uh, brain and body is, uh, is absolutely fantastic. Okay, so you said there that curiosity is the, maybe the optimal state of being. What can you tell us a little bit about the biology of curiosity and what's actually happening in the brain and body when we're when we're being curious? Yeah, it's a fascinating thing that, because it's so obvious, uh, and we just I'll I'll do it simple. I mean, we can go into some of the of of the the, the possible neuroscience. I haven't had the millions of dollars to go off and do, you know, the appropriate fMRIs. But it, you know, you know, I'm not dead yet, so maybe the money will come. But when you think about it, uh, curiosity requires a certain uh, set of of behavioural expressions in order to be evident. So if I'm curious, I'm going to be moving forward. I'm going to be um, moving into something. Oh, what's that? Uh, if I'm curious, I'm going to have a positive and positive anticipation of where I'm going. Otherwise, it's fearfulness. So, oh, dear, that's a problem. You go, oh, what's that? And there's a sense of something's, something's coming that's going to be of interest. Uh, that's interesting. That's, that, that's wonderful. Um, you also need to you, you, you clarify uh, and you focus your attention. And it's not like stressful focus where you close your mind in around the, the, the problem, the, the danger, the threat. Curious attention actually has a broad uh, and peripheral sort of framework to it. Oh, that's really good. Oh, and there and there. And there. so there's sort of a, a, a one scans because one feels safe to do so Uh, and then what is fascinating when we when we come across something or we get a an answer when uh, we figure out something or we learn something or there's a serendipitous surprise it's like oh wow so when the uh, I know this wonderful experiment I was was watching it was on television and people you know when you put the egg on top of a a, a bottle you, you put a lighted taper in the bottle you put a, a hard-boiled egg on top and as the taper burns out and it changes the pressure it pulls the egg into the bottle and everybody always goes oh wow well that's a um a, a little release of of the endorphins and the encephalins so we actually get rewarded when we're curious and come across answers because that makes us eager 
on a dopamine a dopaminergic level later to move towards curiosity again so you've got serotonin um, you must have serotonin happening because it's it's calming the amygdala because we know that stimulates the gabaergic system we know we're getting dopamine because we're positively anticipating we know we're getting clarity but also peripheral clarity in our prefrontal cortex that's norepinephrine and uh, or noradrenaline depending on which country you're in and um, uh, acetylcholine we know we're getting uh, little puffs of pleasure. So we're getting uh, norepinephrine and, nor uh, and the, the uh, endocephalins and the endomorphins. And we also are open to the possibility of engagement with others. We're certainly open to, the, to, to engaging with these because that's what uh, curiosity leads us to creativity. Sort of, oh, what's that about? What are you about? What's happening? So we're most likely got some oxytocin being fired off at the same time. And I don't know any other state of mind that releases in a positive balance all those neurochemicals. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty damn useful thing. And if you can get your depressed patient curious, you watch them, they aren't depressed in that moment of curiosity, at least for that, that short period of moment. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so the thing that comes to my mind now is how much of this is uh, nature versus nurture for, you know, in the, in the game that we're in, we do a lot of interviews. So it almost requires that curiosity element. And that's why I love it because it just, it just brings out a better state of being every time I have to do it, you know? So how much of this is learned and how much of this is, is innate? Have you thought much about that? Oh, yes, I have a little actually thought about it a lot. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really important. The whole I mean, really, the nature-nurture discussion, uh, and of course, it has been a debate, but now I think it's just a discussion, is really the, the um, now are becoming uh, and bringing us into the inevitable awareness that we're not a linear, uh, a linear species. We're not a, a linear world, a linear life. We're a complex system. So there are all kinds of things that contribute and add to the system along the way. So we have initial conditions uh, and the initial conditions set up the framework of the system. And then as we go along, there are various things that change. There's organizing principles and rules and various attractors and changes and variances and, and disruptors that come in. So uh, when you think in systems and this is something I'm just sort of jumping, dumping on you now. But when you think in systems, of course, there's nature and nurture. There's initial conditions. Then there are things that occur uh, over time that add and alter and vary and orient the experience. So curiosity is an orientation. Happiness is an orientation. Sadness is an orientation. Depression is an orientation. And the body will collectively and in its unique and individual way, move itself into the state of being that is reflective of that experience. So one doesn't cause the other. All things are co-incident and, uh, and co-responsive. It seems that a big part of this, Richard, like to really get the benefit from curiosity is being able to be curious about simple things, you know, like just the everyday things that, that are going on around us. Like if you can be curious about, I don't know, you've got this like mirroring hands approach, for example, but even just like yep. your, your hands, you know, if you take a real look at your hands, like it's, it's a pretty incredible structure you've got there, you know, like yeah. curiosity. Yeah. It, it, it isn't, it, it is a natural, uh, uh, a natural part of our state. I mean, probably the drive of it, uh, yeah, Panksepp gave us the insight too, when he talked about seeking, but it's also play is one of the other positive drives forward, forward moving drives. I actually have um, uh, come to the conclusion or at least the ideas that curiosity, what we've done is we've isolated, we've, we've limited it by making mostly our curiosity about finding how things work, you know, that uh, getting the information of learning the information, uh, analyzing and, uh, and perhaps just uh, pulling things apart and putting them back together again, which is fantastic. But we also learn a lot from play so this is where we get serendipitous learning and most of our social engagement and uh, a lot of our awareness of our body is learned through play and through rough and tumble and through 
what we call what well, play is really what's called unregulated experience. So it doesn't have rules, it doesn't have regulations, it just is spontaneous. And then we go, oh, you know, surprise. Uh, but I think the the real purpose of our or the the the, the movement that we our curiosity is taking us towards through new information that we gather by investigation or by play is to then discover a deeper sense of self and of meaning, a different relationship. So we have a breakthrough, a light bulb moment, an inspiration, and that leads to further creativity. And it's the creativity of meaning and purpose. So I think our curiosity so it's not a philosophy for meaning. It's actually a curiosity for meaning because that's what takes us forward and enables us to survive. So in other words, curiosity is a necessary innate element to have in order to better survive. So therefore, I do think it is part of, of nature. But we can actually then heighten curiosity and make it a self uh generating or a self-directed act by being curious about particular things so a friend of mine uh, sort of said a while ago he said i think i think it's curiosity squared that's what it is and he didn't really know what he was saying he was just being sort of intuitive feeling like it it doubles up and uh my uh sort of interpretation of that or adding is is if you are curious by nature and then curious by self-direction then it's you're just curious all the time all it is is just you're curious or curiosity squared uh and everything has the potential to be fascinating uh but it doesn't mean i walk along and go, whoa 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 you know you, you, sometimes you are just you know opening the, the the office door but if it's there as the the undertone as the as sort of the initial framework uh it's really hard to get depressed it's really hard to get too anxious it's it's really hard to get too bogged down by the difficulties of life it's really hard to um uh go into the negativities of seeking which is where we have things like um, uh, addictions and various in that area particularly because addictions and those sorts of areas is very much about the lack of relationship whereas curiosity enables you to be open towards relationships all the time and and i do often get criticized for talking to inanimate objects but they're quite interesting you know, mm. So, sort of, Rock, how are you going there? Oh, you're looking a bit, uh, you're looking a bit sort of crystal there, a bit of a glint. Oh, that was nice. I hope you're feeling well today. And it's a bit odd, but it just makes every moment of the day potentially interesting. Uh, I, I, I want to heighten the fact that I'm not saying we all have to be happy or curious. Or there are always. The, the flow between chaos and rigidity in life. But uh, if curiosity is your is a foundation and one of the, the, not only the initial conditions, but also one of the organizing principles of your life, everything changes for the better. Until, until you, you said that, you know, I never had thought about this from like an evolutionary point of view, you know, those of our ancestors that would have been curious, um, there would have been a payoff to that because that would have been, associated with seeking behavior, finding resources, finding food, et cetera. So we've got this whole neurochemical cocktail that gets released whenever we, we are curious and maybe that's what's, that's what's going on there. And then another thing that came to mind was we interviewed Janina Fisher for our addiction summit coming up. Ah, yes. Yeah. She's fabulous. Yeah. One of the first, first things she does whenever she's working with clients, particularly whenever they're struggling with addictions is she tries to switch their orientation from maybe judgment or shame or whatever to curiosity, because she says that gets the prefrontal cortex going and gets them into these more, I suppose, evolved parts of the brain. Now, something I'm curious to ask you about, Richard, is you went through a transition. I think you were an actor until the age, until your early forties, and then you've yeah, moved into yeah. the therapeutic world. So um, the first thing I want to ask is how has your experiences in acting how has that informed your 
therapeutic work today? That's the first thing. And then I'll ask you the next question after. Okay, great. It's a great question. And just a quick one on Janita. I mean, you can see that people are doing this thinking and she's saying the prefrontal cortex. But more to the point, it actually activates uh, areas. Most of the areas that supply and, and generate these um, neurotransmitters occur in the subcortical region. In the, so it, it's it's an older history and there's, you know, we, we won't get, there's lots of stuff in there anyway in the neuroscience and I've written a bunch of articles about it. But um, uh, so even people like Janina are only halfway, in my thinking, there's more, there's more to go. But where were we? We're acting. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I did a workshop uh, at, at the Milton Erickson Foundation conference a few years ago entitled Almost Everything I Know in Psychotherapy I Learned in Acting School. Uh, because it's true. There's so much that we do in psychotherapy. The, the, the understanding other people, uh, their dialogue, their actions, their movement, um, looking for the, uh, the self-actualization within ourselves as well as the self-actualization within others. And you can learn so much about who you are when you're other people. Uh, when you find the other people within you. I mean, we talk about the multiple selves or the, the multiple uh, expressions of, of self. Well, I've played uh, young people, old people, females, uh, murderers, heroes. And, uh, and I, I, I was amazed how I could find a person like the character in, you know, the, uh, Hamlet, you know, uh, I found the crazy guy uh, who wasn't crazy, but was crazy. And uh, and it, it was really interesting because I, I actually used a line when sometimes clients come in and they say, they say, oh, do you think I'm crazy? And I say, oh, I've played Hamlet. You're fine. And it, it, it sort of disquiets. But uh, a lot of the uh, of the capacity to be a successful human being, a successfully functioning human being, and therefore a successfully functioning therapist, is awareness of your being, uh, everywhere from the self, the cognitive conscious self, to that, uh, that inner intuitive uh, implicit sense of self. Uh, you know, we did exercises uh, where, where um, someone would approach us, a teacher would approach us from behind, we'd have our eyes closed, and he would move his hands towards our back. And then more often than not over the first because quite a few weeks his hands would reach out our backs and we go oh. and then came the day when i said you're near and suddenly you thought wow for the first time in i don't know how long i am feeling with my i'm feeling the the energy the 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 the, the context the context of other people around me without having to be touched uh now that was pretty exciting as a you know 19 20 year old um and those sorts of of awarenesses of being i seriously kind of but joke half jokingly argue that everybody should do a year of acting as a, a national service because when you have been a lot of people as different from learning how to defend yourself from other people you're a lot less likely uh, you're a lot more likely to want to engage with them and a lot less likely to want to you know, have a war with them. Uh, and so I think it was absolutely vital. My perception of language, the, 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 the lilt in the voice, the things that Ernie Rossi was learning from Milton Erickson. Uh, and, and in volume three of the 16, um, uh, the 16 volumes, Ernie replays a, a transcript of when he was saying, so, so the therapist has to, he has to be aware of facial expressions and and vocal tone and 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 verbal sonority and body movements and and adjustments. And Erickson said yes. And Ernie said, "Wow, that's a lot harder than just giving them a therapy." And Erickson said yes. And so, acting has actually been a fundamental and vital training ground. I, I was quite successful. I did quite a lot of things. But in my 40s, uh, you know, I, I hadn't quite cracked the stardom thing. So moving into psychotherapy, 
people thought was weird, but it actually was incredibly uh, sensible and useful um, and valuable utilization of all that previous training. It's fascinating. So it's that, that whole phrase of, you know, you can only connect the dots looking back. And, uh, you know, it just, it strikes me that it could be very beneficial for therapy for a couple of reasons. And um, the first is that it kind of forces you to engage in perspective taking, you know, you've really got to get into the mind of the act or the, the role that you're playing. So you've really got to take that perspective, which can be beneficial in the rest of your life. And then the other thing is that, you know, it must teach you a lot about the change process because you could be playing like someone else mentioned this to me um, that I interviewed before, but he said, you know, you could be playing a murderer um, in the afternoon and then go home and like have a meeting with your family as a completely different self you yeah. know so it must change you a lot it, but teach you a lot of change yes it's a, it's it's actually a wonderful way uh on a on the positive side of things of learning more about who you are because you have to figure out who to return to uh, and of course some people uh, have struggled with that peter sellers is a great example of of sometimes uh, the, there was a time when he was with wasn't coming out of his dressing room and and michael parkinson and and parkinson went into the dressing room and said uh, peter what's the trouble he said i i don't know who to be and he said well just come out as whoever you want and so he came out of one of the characters from one of his films which was actually unfortunately the the one of the german you know sort of nazi things from uh, from from the the things that some of the things he did but we can get lost and people get lost people get lost in the distractions from the clarity of of inner inner connection and inner peace and one of the things that, uh, which is another one of the, my books, when I'm talking about the the impact on mental orientation uh, that occurs because of the high degree of external evaluation that we give ourselves, what I call the win or loser world, where where you have to win and you can't lose, but winning and losing is based on what other people say, and so this changes you to become more defensive and become more prone to anxiety, more prone to um, uh, depression, more prone to uh, uh, express a an away sort of emotions, fear and, and concern and, and all those sorts of stuff as different from the positive, more moving forward, play, curiosity, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. This is so interesting. Now, I heard you've I've heard you quote uh, Milton Erickson elsewhere saying that uh, the best type of therapy is the one that never gets repeated. Could you maybe expand on that well, a bit and why that's why that's important? Here's, yeah, here's 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 the here's the catch twenty two. Here's the here's the, the the cat amongst the pigeons. Is it possible that despite the fact that we have some fantastic and wonderful therapeutic explorations and examinations and development and creations of methodologies that we've actually forgotten where the origin, what the origin is all about. Because all these therapies and all these practices, where do they come from? They came from us. They came from stuff we do. Uh, and in fact, I quite often like to quote uh, it's the film, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. And, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he lost all this money or there was a financial thing. He was the, the, the manager of the bank. And he thought, oh, my God, it's all my fault. I've done this terrible thing. If I kill myself and, and um, uh, everyone will get the, the money and then everyone oh, gets my fault. I wish I'd never been born. Then the angel comes down and waves the magic wand and he goes through the town as if he'd never been born. No one recognizes him. They're all nasty. His, his wife is actually a spinster. So his children are never born. And he goes, Oh no, this is terrible. This is terrible. I should have been born. I, it's wonderful. Magic wand again. They end up the happy families, hugs, hugs, hugs. He had this terrible belief. He moved into a, a distorted sense of reality. Uh, he went through he went through an experiential framework to reframe his belief and his patterns of ideas standard cbt in a film made 15 years before aaron beck ever thought of it so it's it's a part of our behavior system it's a part of what i call our natural uh our natural um uh, uh mental health immune system but the ones that we've pulled out and now we're actually getting ones that are 
more and more unusual or, or rare, but they're a part of, of reasonable human behavior. But what we did, we took them out and then we said, oh, well, this is the way, this is what makes people better. We've got evidence based. So now we'll put it back onto people. Rather than looking for learning about all these things and looking for what the client is expressing, are they expressing a CBT type of thing? Are they expressing a somatic type of thing? Are they expressing a visual type of nature? Um, are they doing things that I don't have to ask them to do, so therefore I'm controlling their framework, but I'm allowing them to express and I'm piggybacking on my knowledge and my expertise. Uh, uh, with the mirroring hands process, which gives you a lot of latitude uh, without having to go to great depths of explaining it, but gives the, 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 the client a lot of latitude. I remember a wonderful guy and uh, was a group exercise I was teaching. And I looked up at him and his eyes were moving back and forth. They were closed, but his eyeballs were moving back and forth, you know, rapid eye movement stuff. And we got to the end of it. And I, I asked him, what was going on in your experience? He said, well, I was thinking about this very traumatic experience and I was getting quite upset about it. And then I went into this quiet stage and, um, and then I don't know what happened, but you just called me and you asked, I, I've just sort of really, I can't remember what happened, but I feel much better now. Spontaneously induced EMDR, which is exactly what happened with Francine Shapiro. She didn't invent it. She discovered it. She noticed it. She was curious and explored it. So that's why if we pay attention, sometimes there's standard therapies or pretty standard or combinations. Of, we're all talking about integrating therapies now. Well, of course we are. That's what we should have been doing. We're, we're, we're just slow in realizing where it, where it came from in the first place. Um, but if we look at someone when they're working and we just work with them, and I had a guy, I had these little fun chalkboards. I used to have a little saying, little something cute. And I just put one saying, life is not, and I put a set of scales, just with two things. It's more like, a, and I drew a mobile with all these several. And he came in, he said, that looks good. Can we, can we do the mobile of my life? And I went, yeah, sure. So I had a little whiteboard. We got out, we did the mobile of his life and he worked away and he put his parents there and they were a big heavy weight and then he had to put him with this and then his friends were here and his work was here and he was going and every time he put something somewhere he'd look at it and then he'd go oh i know what's happening there oh that's a stuff and blah 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 and eventually he said but how can i how? he said oh just because he's looking at his the, the weight of his of the negativity from his parents and he said can i move the fulcrum you know, the, the the little bit in the middle that everything balances from i just said listen i've never done any of this before this is fantastic you can do whatever you like how empowered was this client and how how much was i a facilitator and an assistant anyway we moved the fulcrum and he said if i move the fulcrum there which makes my friends and my work and my relationships a much better balance the only way i can make that work is if i reduce the weight of my parents and so we leant forward and he rubbed out the circle and he drew a smaller one and he sat back and he said oh my god richard you're the first person to ever see me truly and I swear to god i'm sitting there going yes i have no idea oh i you know i was i was with you i'm i'm following you and then he came back the next week and he said i came to you because i've been miserable for as long as I can remember. I can't remember just spontaneously smiling. He said, I've been smiling all week and we've kept up and that's uh, maintained. You know, he had his ups and downs, but he said, I've never stopped smiling again in his life. I've never done that again because it's never been appropriate. Uh, so it was the perfect. So that's what Erickson was saying. The one that you, you've never done before and you never do again, is most likely a perfectly attuned, the most attuned you are to the client's capacities, the client's wants and needs, and the client's natural uh, uh, predilections. So that's the nature of that. Short answer. <laughs> My son says, Dad, if you start talking about dinosaurs, we're in trouble. But you know, hopefully that explained it with some, some degree of clarity.
it was a, a great example to illustrate the point. And what comes to mind for me there is that if you're approaching a therapy session and you've got a framework that you want to impose on the session, then that's going to take you out of that attunement and it's going to create a sort of sense, sense of separation between you and the client, which is going to prevent that kind of something as magic as that showing up, you know? Yeah. I have only only called them uh, creative moments. Uh, uh, I'm doing work now. I've got a PhD I'm doing on um, uh, uh, the question is about client responsiveness, which is not where the, the, the client responds to you. It's where you respond to the client. And uh, he called them uh, creative moments. Uh, the guy, Bill Stiles, who's been doing this stuff for, for the last 20 years or so too, he calls it appropriate moment-by-moment -moment responses to the client's to what the to what the client puts forth, what is successfully working for the client, and um, it's really uh, instead of being a uh, uh, an interventionist work, which still is very effective and still can be very good. I'm not telling people not to do these things in any way, in any stretch. And sometimes I do when that's appropriate for a client when they just need something done to them. But I'm sitting there listening. What's the word? What's the lilt? What's the change? And one of my favorite ones is, is, is these amorphous words, these ambiguous words. I say, oh, I'm sick of it. Can't stand it anymore. It's too much. It's just too much. And I go, great. So I'll get my little whiteboard out. I go, sick of it. Can't stand it. Too much. And I'll put then a big it. And I'll say, wow. So all we got to do, we now know it's really bad. What's it? What's it? You've now become, it's become something that, you've you've lost grasp of and i go oh i never thought of that because <laughs> of course they were focused on the on the problem mm -hmm. and the creative moment is this um, beautiful gem but sometimes they say something specifically and they'll but they're focused on the you know so and so and so makes me feel this so and so makes me feel that yeah 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 sure you feel bad that's why you're here oh so and so ah that's what's interesting. And that's what I learned in acting school. That's what I learned from Shakespeare. Why is it important that therapists learn multiple different types of therapy and not just the one approach? Yeah. Well, that goes back uh, to what I was saying, because we're learning all these therapies are differentiated elements of a single human system. And when a client comes in, it would be lovely if they all came in with the, 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 the natural capacities and inclinations and predilections for the therapy that we've learned. Um, in, the, in the client responsive stuff that uh, Stiles and, and some of those guys are talking about, they talk about adjusting your therapeutic approach moment by moment. And I think that's obviously very good. Um, I tend to try and be even more fluid and learn, and not so much learn, but become aware of as many as possible, and uh, and most of them leave openness. Um, I mean, I've done art therapy with people because they started to bring me art, uh, or you know, therapeutically beneficial art. So I did art therapy. Now I studied heaps in between sessions, but they started it. I had another one. I was doing mirroring hands, and they said, I've got this incredible image in my hand. So we started doing image therapy and metaphor therapy through images, and she would come uh, each week with new images. Uh, so I went in, in that direction. Um, so there's a, there's a degree of various, a certain set of, of therapeutic approaches that sit well with you, that fit with your capacities and your predilections and you should be well focused and geared up on those but if the client starts to go over here i have no resistance i've never experienced resistance i've experienced people having difficulty or not feeling comfortable with with the work we're doing so i just change i'm just shift where do you want to go i it, it, it was an extraordinary experience and, and it was quite surprising because I was giving an example of what Erickson said, the purpose of the, the work of the of the therapist is to to give the response ability for effective therapy back to the client um, to try and get them centered. So anyway, I was giving a, a demonstration of mirroring hands or something or a, 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 what a client responsive approach, and the, someone came out from the audience and I said, "Oh, where would you like to sit?" And a couple of chairs, and they sat, and I said, "Well, 
are you comfortable? And they said, yeah. And so I sat down. I said, it's okay if I'm here. Because I've heard people talk about don't sit in front, don't, don't sit beside. So what's comfortable for you? They said, oh, no, that's really great where you are. Anyway, a friend of mine came to me afterwards who just retired after 40 years working with uh, Kaiser Permanente. He said, you know, I've never given the client the authority to choose their chair. What a brilliant idea. My God, this is fantastic. And I thought, yeah, it's not been the standard approach. Um, a lot of people are doing it, and that's what my PhD will be examining, how many people are doing this. But that that way of forming a co-creative experience and to give the client uh, that sense that they have con they have a degree of control, in fact, the greater control. Now, someone comes in, they say, I don't know where to sit. Oh, I don't know. Well, of course, I'm responsive. I'll say, oh, well, how about you sit there? Of course, I'm going to uh, hold their own uh, uh, expression and what they ask for. And I'll say, but if you ever want to change chairs, you just ask me. You just say, you're, you're perfectly welcome to do that. But if you want me to help you. So it's, again, that feeling the room like you did with an actor. Someone comes in and says hello. When they, when they walk on stage, you want to know, who they are, where they've been, what they had for breakfast, how much family, how angry they are, how happy they are, you know, how many dogs they had when they were a kid. That's what you bring on as a full character. That's what a client brings to you. They bring a full human being, not just their problems and not just something that um, is going to be appropriate for the therapy you think is a good idea. This is this makes a lot of sense. And you know, your approach, it sort of reminds me of like, it sounds like you're in a continuous or a per perpetual state of beginner's mind in therapy. You don't, you, you, you're, you're in that place most of the time. You've got this mind like water approach, you know, and. Uh, I've, uh, got, I've, I've, I've got a, I, I mean, that's nice. I, it was actually, that was the title of the, the reviews I did of, uh, uh, Ernie said to me, I want you to review the 16 volumes. Uh, of Ericsson's work for uh, the Ericsson newsletter. So, and we're now reproducing them in the Science of Psychotherapy magazine. And uh, it was called The Beginner's Mind. And uh, so I approached it that there. And I thought about it. I said, yeah, it sounds a little bit, that sounds a little bit too um, uh, self-effacing. And I call it naive curiosity. Mm. So I come with, I come in not knowing what you're about, absolutely full of what I'm, what I've got, but with a curiosity to discover and contribute. So that's the the way I approach the the language and the the um, the orientation of it. I think this maybe leads well into the next question I wanted to ask: Is can you tell me about the fields of actuality, probability, and possibility, and their relevance for psychotherapy? Possibility is probably uh, curiosity and possibility are the, the the things that have um, really been my my uh, my main focus of trying to understand because there's so many other people doing fabulous work on other things I just borrow from them but this is that's where I've sort of focused my attention and possibility in the sense of the work we do what makes possibility interesting. Because there are certainly things that we can resolve out of, uh, out of what we already know. But possibility, if we think of that as what we don't yet know, or we don't yet understand. So the possibility field sits just at the edge of our, our present experience. And it is the nature of the future. The future is the possibility field. Now, Actuality is those things that have been actualized. Well, that's everything behind us. Uh, and in everything behind us, there are lots of fabulous tools, both cognitive and, and just biological, all the nurture stuff that we've picked up. But some of the nurture is damaging. So, of course, we also have trauma and difficulty and struggle. So we have, we have interruptions. But that's all behind us. So the behind is useful. Uh, in the context of what it what it tells us, but the answers are not in just what is possible, meaning what I think now is possible. It's in what I don't even know exists, 
uh, like you could do um, mobile therapy and move the fulcrum. Now, they're all made out of actualities, uh, certainly, but we we created an entirely new version, a, a entirely new vision of the experience. And what is the struggle, I think, that, and, and what is the sufferance, and particularly this, this win-or-loser world, this, this wanting to make sure, this, this fear of, um, of unpredictability, this, this fear of the fact that I, I'm not quite sure what's happening, is that we, we have the possibility of field right in front of us, which is the space that Ernie would call the growing edge. So we have our growing edge. And what we do is we go, well, I don't really want to go in there. I, I do want to go in there because I want to expand. I mean, when you're four, this doesn't worry you because you haven't got any, you've got very, very little actuality. So everything's about the possibility field. But the, long, the more you get of that, the more you go, well, I'll just put some of my actuality in front of me and a little bit, maybe just two or three steps. And I'll just push the possibility. I'll get to the possibility field, but I just want a couple of secure, predictable sort of steps. But then what we tend to do, and particularly when the world is pressuring us to survive, is we just keep pushing the possibility field away from us. And I call this little gap, and this is just my own language, uh, the, the probability bridge. So I just want something, some security uh, of the probability bridge. Now, I find the probability bridge nice, and sometimes I use it, but it's boring, and it just stifles my curiosity. So I just go out of the way, bring this back, and stick my head in. And uh, look what's happened. I don't know. I've just had this extraordinary, for me, my life has been extraordinary. Um, not extraordinary compared to others, but for me, it's been extraordinary because I couldn't have imagined myself being where I am now uh, when I was 20 uh, or even 30. And I used to say to my <laughs> acting friends when I bump into them, say, hey, what are you doing now, Richard? And I said, well, um, I'm a neuroscientific psychotherapist who likes to discuss genetics and uh, the, the nature of possibility and curiosity. And they go, <laughs> that's great <laughs> what are you really doing <laughs> so, so as it goes it's absolutely fascinating and the thing that really whenever i was just preparing for this, the thing that really jumped out at me was that the aim of this is sort of to create a state of being that can move forward in the world without the need for predictability without needing to know exactly what's going to happen and whenever you're working with a client in therapy that's kind of what you're hoping to achieve yep it's really hard because what i'm suggesting and i'm not the first philosopher who's done this and first person who's done it what i'm suggesting is that given the opportunity and the appropriate circumstances we have a complex self-organizing system that will seek to find wellness. Uh, now we see this in our biology, but I think we also have this in our psychobiology. And so that's the nature of stuff. We, we were talking to someone the other day. He said, I just help people get into themselves, get back in touch with themselves. And he said, I had someone who had an eating disorder and we didn't treat the eating disorder at all. We just treated their, their lack of fascination with their own life. And after six or eight weeks, uh, he said, I, I said to her, well, how's that eating disorder? We haven't done much about that. And she said, oh, yeah, oh, that's gone. Uh, I'm too busy doing this other stuff now. You know? um, so so there's uh, uh, and another example was uh, a friend of mine uh, runs a recovery center called Recovery in uh, Alexandria in, in Egypt because he was looking after um, uh, uh, recovered drug addicts in hospital, but they would just go out and you know, they would they would take again they come back so he started this recovery center and uh so he's doing that then the egyptian spring comes along and suddenly they all then had about 50 men and they all had to go back to protect their 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 streets and but you know by doing that and um sharif was sitting there saying all you could see there were no police there was no army there were just uh the the, the local community was doing things and i could see them and drug dealers they were just everywhere it was just what a prime time when everybody's stressed 
Anyway, they came back and not one of his uh, people went back on drugs, took any drugs. And uh, cutting a sort of a long story short, he was he was very gentle in, in, in discussing it with them. But fundamentally, what they said was, we didn't because what we were doing was too important. Okay. So when we look at addiction, when we look at why we go off uh, and do things is something else that we are not important enough. What we are being and doing is not important enough. And we need something else to come along and get us that importance, solve that that um, that disconnection, that dissociation and that loneliness that we might that we might have. Whereas actually when you find this and what's going on here, and there's nothing better than you know doing a, a, a theater school <laughs> to do that. Uh, you, you, you're too busy. I, I, I was all around as a musician and writing and doing all kinds of things in the in the 70s, late 70s and 80s. And I never really got into the cocaine or, or stuff. It was everywhere. Um, I was too busy. It was too busy. I, it, it interfered with my songwriting. I, I, I didn't want to do it. And I won some, you know, major international awards. It was it was really good. Much better than just having a, a couple of hours of um some kind of weird perception of, of me being Jesus or Napoleon or someone. Maybe we should almost choose our responsibilities in such a way that requires the state of being that would be meaningful in and of itself. Like if you choose to be a therapist, then that requires that you show up every day able to serve your clients. You know, if you choose to do interviews and stuff, it's the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Writing the same and the music probably the same for you as well. If you don't have these responsibilities that bring the state of being out of you, then maybe it's a lot easier to fall into addiction yep. or things like and that. That's right. And various things. And and for your system to lose its connection, to become disintegrated, as we talk about in interpersonal neurobiology with Dan Siegel. But the word responsibility is is a great example of the win or loser world coming in. Responsibility. It's who's at fault, who's wrong, who has to pay. And it's a, it's a, it's a, an abomination of 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 a great word because it's like wonderful. We want to have a wonderful life. We want to have a response able life. Mm. And if you find your response abilities, um, and if those response abilities help you, then great. If things aren't working, then and you don't have the response ability, well, then there's stuff to learn, and that can be, you know, when a client goes, oh, I don't know how to do this. Uh, I love it when they say, I don't know. I go, oh, fantastic. Um, and I say, oh, I've got all this stuff I can, I, I, I've, I've uh, you know, all those books there. You don't have to read them. I can give you a summary. And, and they'll go, you know, like you're doing now with some of the things going, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, I like that idea. And you're, you're individually pulling apart and, and forming your own version of uh, of what is satisfying for your idiosyncrasies needs capacities uh, at this moment and so we are all therapists all the time with everyone and that is what uh, comes uh, and we're positive therapists when we just live a kind curious engaged compassionate joyful life uh, as they say, uh, uh, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. If you want everybody to be sane uh, and uh, joyously sane, not uh, boringly sane, be joyously sane, then value add depending upon your tendencies. I did it with acting for a while. I did it with music for another time. I did it as a psychotherapist for time. It's all the same stuff. It's all the same, just different versions, different facets of the diamond. It it seems like you've just been on such a such a fascinating adventure over the years, you know, and you're sort of being led by where where your curiosity and this sense of meaning has taken you. You know, is that is that fair to say? I think I'm very fortunate to 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 do all that. I did have a very good attachment. Uh, I had very uh, positively secure attachment. So so that was a hurdle I didn't have to overcome. And I think there are quite a lot of people who need to sort of work that that um, that dissociative or that um, um, sort of elements, those elements. I didn't have uh, a lot of traumas that I 
didn't learn from. They did. I didn't have a lot of post-traumatic uh, disorder. I more had post-traumatic growth. But my, uh, you know, my my dad and mum split when I was five. Uh, you know, we she found a a, a lovely man who, uh, when I was about eight till uh, thirteen, who was the ma- my main male uh, role model and teacher and things. And he died suddenly when I was thirteen. It's pretty traumatic, uh, but the secure attachment helped. But I'm sure, and I, it's actually I tell the story in uh, in, in in our film on uh, grief, uh, and it's, I sort of say it's somebody else, but it's actually my story. But I was 13 when he when he died, and we we used to, he taught me how to build things, and he taught me how to paint, and he taught me how to uh, be a you know musician. He, he opened all that up. And in this shed that we built, we put our hands in the cement, you know, that sort of classic thing, put your hands in the cement. And I was 16, pulling the lawnmower out of the, the this, this old fibro shed that we built out of bits and pieces, just a wonderful bit of creativity out of, uh, uh, you know, not much money and things. And I put my hand in mine, and of course it didn't fit because I, I was much older. And I just moved my hand and I put it in John's and it fitted. And I had just like this moment and and so yeah so between 13 and 16 I obviously had a lot of shit going down uh, but i pulled it together then then i had other things i've lost all my money twice ah, that's an that can that can make you you know pretty cheery uh, <laughs> and so uh, and what i didn't manage uh, uh what i wasn't response able with uh i found i was able to learn so I'm, I'm fortunate um, that I didn't have to overcome other barriers, as many other barriers that I know some people, uh, because I see them, they come to they come to see me and I tell them my stuff and I say, oh, that's dreadful. I said, yeah, but I didn't have this thing that you had and this trauma you had. So let's clear those. And then if you like what I do, then oh, you know, off you go. You know, go for it yourself. Uh, and that gives people are, 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 I think a good sense of comfort that then they're, they're not dealing with a theorist they're dealing with a, a lived experience uh, theorist just a couple of questions to wrap up Richard uh, for someone listening to this that's maybe at the start of their therapeutic career is there anything and maybe their goal is to sort of become I don't want to say the best therapist they can be because I've heard you say elsewhere that you should be aiming to become uh, more of yourself or the most whatever but yeah, um, yeah. Someone, someone who wants to realize most of their their potential as a therapist. What guidance would you offer to that person? What would you say to someone in that situation? This is this is a great question. It's a good one because you know I'm sitting saying, "Oh, I do this. Don't let that happen." I this thing. certainly as a therapist, uh, you know, I spent four or five years doing the the, the preparatory work. Then I met up with Ernest Rossi. I was his apprentice, not not just being mentored. I mean, I had to. Uh, I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't, or not. I couldn't talk to him. But there was no point in me saying something unless I really thought about it and really worked at it. So it was it was a testing uh, learning period. I went to three or four conferences every year to learn and engage, just as I did when I was an actor. I went to school every week. I would sit in the train and watch people. I would go to every piece of theatre and film uh, that that I could do to just immerse myself in the experience. But the best way to describe it, I think, is through the artistic expression. And because what I'm talking about is the the capacity to improvise, to uh, to co-create an improvised experience with uh, 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 an individual who's not got their 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 instrument working properly and you who've got an instrument but you're not quite sure whether it's you're playing the same type of tune and the essence of a great improviser is somebody who's done the study who's done the techniques and in fact chick korea the the great jazz improviser and musician uh, and very avant-garde and someone said how can i how can I improvise like you, Czech? You know, and he said, "Learn the classics. Learn to read music. Do your scales. Learn to become technically as perfect as you can. Then you forget it and just play." 
But it doesn't mean you have to become brilliant at technique. It, there are points. You get to this point and you improvise with those things. Then you go a bit further and you then improvise with those things and those things before. Then you go a bit further. And uh, I can look back on my last 10 years or so and see three or four times where I thought, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good now. And then I go, oh, no, 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 and I've learned something else. And now it's just this glorious thing where I go, wow, what else can I learn? And now I learn it from clients more than I do from textbooks. It seems that, you know, the more you have a grasp of the maybe the big ideas in therapy, like the, the kind of core foundational concepts, um, the more creative you can be, like the more you have a, a mastery of these kind of key areas. Like, are there any books you'd recommend for someone that wants to sort of develop that understanding? Yeah, all of them. Um, so, but but essentially, if you read these books, not to learn how you can make a human being better, but to read these books, learning how you can understand the human being you have sitting in front of you better, and sometimes the human being that you're seeing in the mirror better. I mean, certainly I have to spruik my own book, I suppose, the the uh, uh, the Practitioner's Guide to the Science of Psychotherapy, but also the Practitioner's Guide to Mirroring Hands, which is this, this more sort of hypnotherapeutic type of practice, but it's it's really a, a, a psychotherapeutic type of practice. And in there, we, uh, particularly in the Science of Psychotherapy uh, book, we really try and say, here's all the details, here's all the facts. But all the way through the book, we, we, we pause with a box saying, okay, now with these facts, this is how you can better understand. So that stuff about the brain, this is how you can better understand the person sitting in front of you. With genetics, here is how these genetics can uh, give you a better potential understanding of the person that is in front of you. Um, I mean, Erickson, uh, Milton Erickson put it rather nicely. He said, the, the trouble with psychotherapists and the way we're taught is that you ask them out to dinner, but they order your food for you. <laughs> And we've kind of got to um, realize that our expertise is not our capacity to intervene, but our capacity to recognize and attune. The first thing we need to do is to learn these techniques and, and find what we, we have the affinity to. Um, for example, my friend Steve Bryan, brilliant, brilliant jazz guitarist, one of the best jazz guitarists in, in, uh, in Australia, went to New York uh, in you know mid to late 20s, uh, was asked to sit in with a band uh, at a, a famous, uh, one of the famous jazz clubs, did his improvisations. He came off stage and said, I don't know what I'm doing. And he went home and he practiced for another two or three months, despite the fact that he was considered one of the best guitarists in, in, in our country. And then he went back and played again. And then he said, I was better. Pablo Casals, you know, when he's in his 80s, was still practicing and doing uh, work with the cello. And they said, what, what are you doing? He said, well, I think I'm starting to get it now. So it's a journey of excitement and pleasure. And each time you and the client resonate and integrate and produce beneficial change, which is the best, the simplest that we should go for, there's just that sense of, wow. I've just participated in something creatively magical. And that is the joy of being human. And that is the wonder of being a therapist. And so we have supervisors. I'm a supervisor. People come saying, oh, I don't know what to do. I did this and that. And more often than not, I've got another idea. And they'll go, oh, never thought of that. So it's by combining heads, having those uh, people that assist all these things are what will bring you, what you learn, what you study. Um, uh, if you're into neuroscience, I mean, there's great people like uh, uh, Luke Cozzolino, Dan Siegel, of course, does a lot of wonderful stuff with interpersonal neurobiology. Um, uh, John Arden does some brilliant books in neuroscience. Go and uh, look at the biology and go look at uh, uh, Robert Sapolsky. You can get all these tapes online. There's the science of psychotherapy. There's heaps of, of uh, uh, stuff that we have for free as well as the stuff that we have. Uh, we've got, you know, I don't know, 15, 1600 hours of, of material where reading and video material. Um, 
go to conferences. Uh, I mean, now they're online. I like going because I also like talking to the crazy people at the conference, uh, the other therapists. And um, there's um, immerse yourself in the joyfulness of the experience of becoming a deeper and richer human being. And that is what will help you become a grand and uh, effective therapist. Richard, I just want to say a huge thank you for taking the time to share some of your wisdom with us and your fascination um, just about your subject. You know, you, you have a real deep love for this and it really comes through in the way you communicate and the way you speak. I think my kind of main couple of takeaways are just like having a basic orientation of curiosity in the world like can only be good, you know, um, that and this sort of like almost like mind like water or beginner's mind approach where you're you're never coming to, to, to a situation with prior expectations but just adapting to whatever's happening you know so um i've really enjoyed this i really enjoyed preparing for it so i want to i want to um just say thank you and where can people find out more information about your work about the science of psychotherapy and maybe take a course with you guys like what would you recommend yeah, so the science of psychotherapy is, is quite easy. The science of psychotherapy.com is our site, which lays out the frameworks and get a lot of the free activities. And the science of psychotherapy, the in the beginning, the science of psychotherapy.net is where we have our academy. Uh, and, uh, and you know, we really try and make it accessible. So we just have a very uh, simple monthly uh, sort of fee at that 15 dollars i think it's 12 12 american dollars anyway uh and uh so there's uh, lots of stuff there that's great value check out uh <laughs> we, we, you could find information about our book but get our book or, or, or obviously on amazon the science of the practitioner's guide to the science of psychotherapy and of course me i'm richard hill uh dot com dot au uh so do that send me an email uh i i, I keep it easy for me richard at richardhill.com.au can't go wrong well can't go too far wrong <laughs> but that's a great you're right well i'll let you go uh thanks a million and just wish you the best of luck going forward ah it, it's been wonderful to do it. it's been wonderful to meet you and catch up with you and of course you know, plug the weekend university uh that's another place you can go to because there's some wonderful stuff in there and again not an expensive uh, uh, place to be able to gain information. Those are the things to look for. There's great bits of information that's uh, really beautifully put together. You've got to find people you can trust, but I recommend the Weekend University as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it.